Well, hello, Alabama Baptist. My name is Ben Bowden. I'm the pastor of First Baptist Enterprise, and I just want to say I am so thankful about being a part of this, uh, th this pastor's conference here in the state of Alabama. I, I grew up in Alabama, actually in Enterprise, Alabama. I came to know Jesus at an Alabama Baptist church, the, one, the very one that I pastor now, First Baptist Enterprise. And so uh, it, it's very special for, uh, to me because Alabama Baptists have poured into me in, in amazing ways, and I have a debt of gratitude. And I tell you, I grew up with what I like to call the, the Bible Belt mentality, good old boy mentality, and that is uh, it, I was inundated with cultural Christianity. Uh, J.D. Greer has used this several times, and so I use this, kind of make it my own. Uh, I grew up with a, with a dog named Bo Cephas. Uh, he was half poodle, half miniature collie. collie. He was uh, sweet as can be. He was ugly as dirt, but uh, he did nothing wrong. And, and by my mentality, by my uh, understanding of Christianity, when I was growing up, my dog Bo Cephas would have been a great Christian. He never drank beer, he never cussed, and he was neutered so his thought life was under control. But obviously that's not Christianity. Uh, I thought I had this idea that if I went to church and I kept my nose clean and I was a pretty morally decent person, then God kind of worked it out in the end. Uh, but of course, that is not the case because that's not the gospel. The gospel is the good news that Jesus Christ has done it all. That on the cross, he said, it is finished. That he took on the wrath of God on behalf of sinners and so that anyone, anywhere who trusts in him, turn from their sin and, and believe on him can be saved. And that's the passion of my life. That's the desire of my life. Um, and so I came to know that when I was 18. Uh, after that, went to Auburn, met my wife, a uh, little Kentucky girl. Her name is Lindsay. Love her to death. We've been married for 15 great years, and um, we have six children. When I started in my 30s, uh, I had zero children, and I, I just turned 40 this year, and now I have six. And so we've, we've had this discussion. We probably need to stop doing so many Bible studies on Genesis 128 that says uh, be fruitful and multiply. Maybe move on to Exodus or so, something like that. But uh, I am so thankful for every one of my children, and I'm thankful for my church here at First Baptist Enterprise. I love this church. I came to know Jesus at this church, and, and, and I have been the shepherd here. Uh, for, for five years as a senior pastor, four years before that as an associate pastor. So almost a decade I've spent. My children are growing up in this church. They're learning the gospel. Um, it is truly one of the great privileges in my life to be the pastor of First Baptist Enterprise. But I have a burden. And so in, in this time, in this short time together, my burden is not merely that this year it's been really, really different and there have been a lot of crazy things happening with COVID-19 and everything else. My major burden has to do with how we handle the Holy Scriptures. And so I'm talking mainly to pastors. This is a pastor's conference. And so uh, people like my mom, hey, hey mom, uh, I'm sure you're, uh, you know, there'll be others tune in, but, but this is mainly addressed to pastors. And one of the burdens I have is because when I came to know Christ, I started ferociously reading my Bible. And I saw some inconsistencies when I looked at churches, Alabama Baptists, and then I looked at the Bible, and I saw this idea of covenantal church membership and this idea of compassionate, gracious, loving church discipline. And I saw almost no churches faithfully carrying this out. And, and, and I just thought, why is there so much inconsistency? And so today, I, 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 being burdened with this and being charged with this idea of submitting to one another, I'm going to challenge you that you would pastor and that I would pastor our churches in such a way as to be faithful to the Scriptures, even in the way that we equip our people to submit to one another. So let's jump in. We're going to be reading Ephesians 5, verses 15 through 21, and really uh, centering in on uh, verse 21 and connecting that to Matthew 18, and we'll, we'll see how we do that in just a little bit. Ephesians 5, verse 15 and following, the Word of God says, Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, 
giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Let's pray. And now, Father God, we pray in the name of Jesus that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit, that we may rightly understand your word and faithfully carry out uh, pastoring and shepherding your church, the church of Jesus Christ, all for the glory of Christ and all the earth. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we take a look at this passage, the, the meaning of this has to do with a spirit-filled church that is walking in wisdom and how that is made up of people who submit to appropriate authorities. In other words, a spirit-filled church is made up of people who submit to appropriate authorities in their lives. So Paul, just after this, gives three examples. We call it the household code. So he talks about um, husbands and wives and, and, and uh, fathers or parents and children and um, uh, servants and bond servants. But of course, uh, while those are the three specific examples, that's not an exhaustive list of appropriate authorities in your lives. I mean, we, we understand the authority of government, uh, as, as it says in, in Romans 13. And of course, considering the whole scope of Ephesians, the authority of the local church is in view as well, which is what we're going to be talking about today. And, and I do think that this is important because, as I said, you know, as Alabama pastors, and Alabama Baptist churches, um, we often pride ourselves in being people of the book. And yet, strong covenantal membership and loving, consistent church discipline is often dismissed and often absent from many Baptist churches in our state. And so, and I don't say this in some kind of like prideful, arrogant way. I say this with a great burden. And I say this as a fellow struggler. This is hard stuff. And there's no cookie cutter approach. But in light of the biblical and historical precedent of these gracious means of church purity, this is a sobering but important discussion that we need to have among pastors and among church members in our state. You know, there are many warnings in the New Testament about being deceived. It's very easy for us to be deceived if we have no external authorities in our life. And so we need one another's love, one another's encouragement, and even one another's correction in order to persevere to the end. And you know, God has given us that in giving us the church. According to Ephesians and according to the New Testament, the church is one of the main authorities in our lives that we are to submit to. Unfortunately, we often make church about uh, preferences and pragmatism rather than authority and family. You know, we, and I think we can all agree, we live in a very individualistic world. Individual autonomy is the air we breathe. That's kind of like the God that we, we serve, lowercase g, in our culture. And that's unfortunately bled over into the church. And so pastors, it's, it's up to us. We have the responsibility through our preaching and through shepherding to patiently correct the slow drift of being conformed to this world and to call our people to be conformed to Christ. And you know, one of the essential ways that we do that is to reclaim the authority of the church in the life of its members. And so that's our main idea. As we dig into this today, our main idea is going to be this. Reclaim the authority of the church in the life of its members. And so, as pastors, that means we have to clarify at least three things. We have to clarify the priority of church membership the purpose of church discipline, and the process of church discipline. All right, so that seems simple enough. That's where we're going. So let's jump in. Number one, first point, clarify the priority of church membership. You know, how we treat the church is a really big deal to Jesus, and how your members treat the church, treat their local church, is a big deal to Jesus. In fact, if you look at Acts chapter 9, verse 4, this is when Paul had, or Saul had his famous conversion. It says, And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why 
are you persecuting me? Now, of course, this is Jesus speaking. And Saul could have said, wait a minute, Lord, um, I'm not persecuting you. I'm persecuting the church. I mean, he, after all, he was going to Damascus to persecute the, the church in Damascus. But you see, what that teaches us is that Jesus so closely aligns himself with the church that to persecute the church is to persecute Jesus. And we could kind of follow that, that stream of logic. To love the church is to love Jesus. To hate the church is to hate Jesus. To be apathetic towards the church is to be apathetic towards Jesus. In other words, what we do with the church is essentially what we are doing with Jesus. And therefore, the church is a big deal to Jesus. And so it's, it's helpful to break it down like we've done for 2,000 years in church history. And that is the universal church. So we could, when we think about the church, we think about it in two dimensions, uh, or really two dynamics. First of all, the universal church, that's all Christians everywhere. But then there's the local church. And that's the living, breathing existence of, of actual Christians that we are, we are responsible to carry out many of the one another passages that, uh, and the one another commands that are in the New Testament. You see, to do the things that the Bible demands of you as a Christian, and as me as a Christian, and as a, the members of your church, as Christians, to do the things that the Bible demands us to do, there must be a formal commitment, which is basically what we call membership. That's what we call church membership. Now, there's not a chapter and verse that we can point to uh, that, that can say, okay, thus saith the Lord, you must uh, join a church. But there are several passages that we need, to, we, we need to look at that actually imply that we ought to make this formal commitment to the local church, what we call church membership. First of all, Hebrews 13, verse 17. It says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Now, there are really two things going on there, two layers. First of all, this is speaking to uh, Christians, and it's saying to Christians, you must obey your leaders. Now, as I, mean, I say this to the members of First Baptist Enterprise all the time, you have to ask the question, if you're being thoughtful here, well, who, who am I commanded? Who is Jesus demanding that I submit to? Is it a, like all Christian preachers? What about the crazy folks on TV that are saying, hey, send in your money and I'll give you a handkerchief that like, makes all your wildest dreams come true? I mean, who are we talking about right there? And then uh, it says, for they were keeping watch of your souls as those who will have to give an account. Pastors, I mean, this is something that ought to keep us up at night. That there are men and women who will, you and I, who, who we will have to give an account for. And I want to know as a pastor who those people are. I don't want to have to stand before the Lord one day and, and be like, well, wait a minute, Lord, who, who, who are these people? I want to know exactly who they are. And so by implication, what is that saying? By implication, there is a thing called church membership, or we can call it what we want to, but there's a formal inclusion in the church that, that, uh, that the leaders are clear on who they're going to have to give an account to, and the members are, it's clear to them who they are to submit to. I'm not going to have to give an account to every Christian on the face of the earth, and, and, and Christians aren't having to give an account. They're not going to have to submit to every pastor, every Christian leader. And so it demands this idea of church membership in the local church. Take, for instance, 1 Corinthians. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 2. Of course, this is, one of the, uh, uh, this is one of the places of church discipline carried out to excommunication. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But it says this, the church of Corinth, Paul is writing to this church, and he says, Let him who has done this, there was a grievous sin that this man had done, let him who has done this be removed from among you. Now, just think about that. Be removed. So there's a formal uh, removal of this man. Now, if there's a formal uh, removal, then there's got to be a formal inclusion on the front end. Call it what we will. That's church discipline. 
Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6. It's talking about the same man. Uh, there was punishment that took place. And uh, he says, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6, punishment by the majority is enough. Now, how do you have a majority? How can you have a majority? You, the, the only way, the only way that you, that you can have a majority is if you know exactly how many people you're talking about. If there's no formal where the lines are drawn and no formal inclusion, no, no uh, uh, list of people you're talking about, there's no way you can get a true majority. So, pastors, we need to clarify for our people that church membership is biblical. Is it biblical? Yes, it's assumed. Every Christian ought to be a part of a church where they make a commitment to God and to one another. And that means no Christian on the face of this earth should be in the wilderness of churchlessness. That should not happen. That's not a good thing. And so we must clarify the, um, clarify the priority of church membership. Number two, number two, we must clarify also the purpose of church discipline. Clarify the purpose of church discipline. So on the front end, we've got to take care of church membership, but then we also on the back end have to understand the purpose of church discipline. And this, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to plead with you uh, because I, I'm, I'm, this is what I'm walking through right now. You got to play the long game here. You can't just show up because this is not pastor discipline, it's church discipline. You can't just show up with your six shooter of church discipline and start popping your people. Like That's not going to be helpful in the long run. What you've got to do is patiently correct as, as uh, 2 Timothy tells us to do. We must be, be long-suffering with our people. We must play the long game and teach them the word over and over and over and over because the power of God is unleashed on the people of God through the Word of God. The Word does the work. It's not going to be your creativity and convincing people. It's not going to be your leadership and just how, how uh, heavy-handed or soft-handed or anything else you can be. It's going to be the Word that changes the culture and the DNA of the church that they actually want to carry out faithful church discipline. But in order to do that, they must know the purpose. And we can say at least two things about the purpose. Uh, first of all, its aim is restoration, not retribution. Oh, how important this is. You see, sin divides. Sin is communal. Uh, that means that it's never isolated to the individual. So sin affects the whole body. It breaks fellowship not only vertically but, but horizontally. And here's what we are to do according to God's Word. Look at Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. The Apostle Paul says, Brothers... So he's talking to Christians in the church of Galatia. If anyone, and we could say if anyone in that church, anyone in the church of Galatia, is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual, in other words, who are filled with the Holy Spirit, should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. You see, restoration has to do with pointing out someone's wrongdoing and loving them enough to risk the awkwardness and, and all of that to do what it takes to bring them back into fellowship because sin cuts that fellowship off. It's not that you're cutting that fellowship. It's, it's that it's already been cut off by unrepentant, blatant sin. You know, a wandering sheep, a wandering sheep uh, may get yanked back by the shepherd's staff. And that may not be all that pleasant. It may hurt a little bit for a time, but it's actually keeping them from harm. Look at Hebrews chapter 12. Verses 5 and 6. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. The Lord disciplines those. You want to see a sign of discipline from a father to his child? How well does he consistently and faithfully and lovingly discipline him? That's a sign of actual love. You know, surgery for cancer may be painful to actually cut that cancer out, but in the end, it saves its life. And so let's think through the, the like contrast between restoration and retribution. Restor restoration is about bringing back those who stray. Retribution, on the other hand, is about paying back those who stray. 
So church discipline, I want you to hear me. Church discipline is designed by God not to pay someone back for their sin, but to bring someone back from their sin. That's the difference. And therefore, it should be done with humility and love and grace and wisdom and patience and compassion and gentleness. Now, there may be some people in your church that have serious scars because they've had a bad experience. But just because they've had a bad experience with this doesn't mean that, that it was wrong. It, should, it could be that, that it was actually carried out in an unhelpful and unloving way. But church discipline, often when it's not carried out at all, it can cause people to doubt the love of God. Because the love of God is, there's a means to the love of God, and it comes through the church oftentimes. And when the church just sits passively by like a coward, like a first father, Adam, when, when the enemy is in there doing all kind of harm to God's people, and we say, well, we don't want to judge. That is unloving. That's not being, well, you know, I, we're gracious around here. No, that's not being gracious. That's being unloving. See, while healthy church discipline is not fun and exciting, it's actually a means of grace. So its aim is re restoration, not retribution. But it's also a means of grace. You know, we can often talk about how great God's grace is, and we can sing amazing grace and, and things like that. But we must acknowledge that God has not left His grace in the abstract. He is, He's put skin on it. So, you know, we are saved by God's grace, but the means of God's grace is, is the person and work of Jesus. And we are also sustained by God's grace, but the means of that grace is living under the authority of Jesus, living under the authority of Christ, who has chosen to share some of that authority with the church. You see, every individual Christian should live under the authority of Christ, which is living under the authority of the Bible. And that means that you must live under the authority of the church. Now, you, know, there, you, may, have, you may teach this, and some of your people say, no, where are you getting that? Well, look with me at Matthew 16, verse 18. Of course, this is when Peter makes his big profession of who Jesus is. You're the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And he says, Jesus says to Peter, and I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, rock here refers to Peter in his role in confessing Jesus as the Messiah. And the very next verse, look at this, verse 19. The very next verse tells us that Jesus gives authority to him. So verse 19, it says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And so, in other words, he's saying, I'm giving you the authority to determine who's in and who's out. Now, here's a question. Is that authority isolated to Peter? Well, the answer is no. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20. The church is built on the foundation of the apostles. So authority was given to Peter because of his confession that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God, and as his role as an apostle. And for that same reason, authority was given to the rest of the apostles, and uh, the church was built upon uh, their confessional authority. Now, when the apostles died out, the church the, the church assumed that authority as long as it stood under the authority of Scripture. In other words, Peter has authority to exercise discipline concerning right and wrong belief and behavior for those in the kingdom. So this authority is extended to the church as a whole in Matthew 18, verse 18. So let's turn to this. Matthew 18, let's get a little more details of the church. But first of all, we'll, we'll look at the, the next uh, point, and that is that we are to clarify the process of church discipline. We are to clarify the process of church discipline. Right, so we have, after we've established the priority and the purpose, the priority of church membership, the purpose of church discipline, we now have to clarify the process of church discipline. So step one 
is this. We are to confront alone. Where am I getting that? Look at Matthew 18, verse 15. Jesus says, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault. Between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. So confront alone. Step two, confront with others. Confront with others. Look at Matthew 18, verse 16. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. So that's step two. Step three, tell it to the church. That would be members only. Look at Matthew 18, verse, the first part of verse 17. If he refuses to listen to them, the two or three witnesses, tell it to the church. And then you have step four, and that would be excommunication. Look at Matthew 18, verse 17, uh, the end of verse 17. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Now, it does not tell us, Jesus does not tell us how many times we are to carry out each step how long each step is to take. We don't have that information. That takes great wisdom, and it's going to have nuances, and you having the wisdom to work through the nuances. And I would argue that you probably need to take a long time. We aren't wanting to rush this. And, um, but we're to do this with, with grace and love. And I mean, even right at the end where it says, let him be to you as a Gentile and task letter. Listen, the, the, that's used to describe those who are de, de, deliberately rebellious against God. But, but how did Jesus teach uh, or treat uh, Gentiles and tax collectors? You know what he did? He loved them, and we will too. We just won't call them Christians. You see, the, the, the highest court of appeals is the church. That's the highest authority. When, you become, when people become members of the church you pastor, they are submitting to the to the authority of that church. And so he loved them. We're going to love them too. We're not going to call them Christians. Biblical church membership is only for those who give what seems to be a legitimate profession of faith in Christ and lives in light of that profession. Now, we're going to get accused of judgmentalism. Some are going to say, ah, that's just, you're being judgmental. No, if someone is living in open, unrepentant sin, but they profess to be a Christian, we're not going to say that they're not a Christian. We're just, we just can't affirm that they are. And see, that's what church membership is about. When someone becomes a member of your church, you are affirming them as a Christian. Call it being judgmental. Call it what you want. The, the Bible calls it authority. And the Bible looks to the church to carry out faithfully that authority. Look at Matthew 18, verses 18 through 20. He ends this and he says, the ends of the section, he says, truly I, Jesus says, Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. Now, keep, look at that scripture again. Let's, let's keep that up there. In verse 18, it says, Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. What, what is that? Where, where, where do we recall hearing that? We recall hearing that just two chapters before when Jesus was talking to Peter and he gave the keys of the kingdom to Peter, ultimately to the church we see right here. And so you may have people that if you're teaching this, they may say, why haven't we done this before? I tell you, as a pastor of First Baptist Enterprise, I say over and over again to them, to the members of First Baptist Enterprise, and I bet you could say it to your people, we have done this before. In fact, uh, Dr. Brady Justice, he was the pastor from 1940 to 1965 at First Baptist Enterprise, and he wrote a book on the history of First Baptist Enterprise. And uh, I, I've got a couple quotes for you right here. He said, uh, he said, First Baptist Church Enterprise, FBC, exercised rather strict discipline during its early history. A considerable number of incidents of church discipline 
were recorded in the minutes from 1895 to 1910. He goes on to say, By present liberal standards, discipline of the early church may appear to be severe. Stop right there. A lot of people will say, man, this sounds severe. Like, are you being a little too harsh? Well, he says, yeah, by, <laughs> by present liberal standards, it may sound severe, but he goes on to say, church members had a deep sense of propriety in the early enterprise church and, di and discipline appeared to be exercised with compassion and a desire to restore erring members. And that's how it ought to be done, with compassion and a desire to restore. It's for the, it's for the sake of restoration, not retribution. Not because we're trying to beat somebody up, it's because we're trying to pick somebody up. Not because we're trying to cast somebody out, but bring them back in. And, and not pay them back, but bring them back. Greg Wills um, argues that this was the case of most SBC churches when we look at the history of SBC churches in America. He says, pre-Civil War days, Southern Baptists excommunicated nearly 2% of their membership every single year. And Methodists and Presbyterians were not far behind. 2% every single year. Excommunication was just a way that church, uh, churches operated. Now, of course, some probably did it with an unloving manner, but not all. Like First Baptist Enterprise, it certainly seemed to be done with compassion and a desire to restore erring members. But then he makes the point that after the Civil War, church discipline seemed to flounder. He said larger churches, it became more burdensome. Urban churches concentrated on larger buildings, cooler music, and hit preaching. Church growth models seemed to win the day. They concentrated on pursuing efficiency rather than purity. And he says most all uh, Baptist churches put their energy into reforming their communities to the moral norms of the church. No dancing, no gambling, uh, nothing open on Sundays. And what they did is they stopped reforming themselves. So they, they looked at their community and said, you ought not to be doing this. And they were just looking over, over all their people and saying, don't do this. You need to act like this and be like this. And he says they stopped reforming themselves. In other words, they stopped uh, seeking to purify themselves and they only wanted to purify society. <laughs> and even today, how often do you hear Christians bellyache about politics and pop culture and how the, the, Twitter and, and uh, it used to be like back in the 90s when I was coming, MTV was ruining the minds of young people and you could just, you know, you just fill in the blank and, and we, we don't have prayer in school anymore. But when, I've got to ask pastors, when do you ever hear Christians actually burdened that their church is not practicing church discipline? I never hear that. And so we've got to ask the question, what happened? I mean, how, how can this, this practice of church discipline and covenantal church membership be so clearly biblical and clearly historical and almost non-existent in evangelical churches today? What happened? Well, Greg Wills goes on to, and I have the quote for you right here. He goes on to say, they lost the resolve, and he's talking about Baptist churches specifically. They lost the resolve to purge their churches of straying members. Well, why is that, Greg? He said, no one publicly advocated the demise of discipline. No Baptist leader arose to call for an end to congregational censures. No theologians argued that discipline was unsound in principle or practice. It simply faded away. As if Baptists had grown weary of holding one another accountable. What he's saying is this. There has never been a strong biblical stance that compelled churches, hey guys, we need to stop doing church discipline. It just became obtuse as churches focused on other things, and some of them unbiblical things, and it just faded away. And so what we have today, and even in Alabama Baptist churches, 
what we have today is churches who think that they are holding to biblical fidelity when in fact they are not. And Baptist pastors, Alabama Baptist pastors, that should burden us. Now, this is heavy stuff. And there's a lot more to talk about to, to kind of work through the nuances and, and work through wisdom and, and what does this look like when the rubber meets the road and how do we how do we land this plane? There's a lot to discuss. But and so I'm just kind of putting it out there and, and saying this is a conversation in Alabama Baptist circles and, and I would say even not just within our whole state, but but local communities like around the Wiregrass. We have a Wiregrass Pastors Network. We get together and we, we talk about things and we try to tease out and we pray for each other. That's what I'm saying. We need we need to do that in our communities among Baptist pastors and ask the question, what does it look like to actually carry this out faithfully? Or what does it look like at least to get on the own ramp, even if it takes five years or 10 years or 15 years or 20 years to get there? What does that own ramp look like to carry this out faithfully? The way that Jesus demands, the way that history tells us, the way that we ought to biblically and faithfully carry out covenantal church membership and compassionate church discipline. And so here's what I want to challenge you with. Would you just pray? Maybe get with some leaders in your church and pray this. Maybe pray just with you and your spouse. But you would pray, Lord, what does this look like for us? And just lay that before the Lord. Lord, what does this look like? Where do we begin? What does this look like? And I, and I want to say I'm, I'm thankful that, that there are churches that are, that are revitalizing and, and they're, they're, they're realigning uh, the, the DNA of their church and the way they carry out membership and discipline with what the Bible teaches. But no one does this, uh, I don't know if anybody's doing this perfectly. It's hard work. And so I think it could be a great prayer for all of us. Lord, what does this look like for us? Get some deacons, get some leaders, and just bring that before the Lord. And I bet that that would be something that the Lord Jesus Christ would honor. Alabama Baptist, I love you. I'm praying for you. Let's continue to uh, fight the good fight of faith as we continue to lift high the name of Jesus because he said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. And that's what we're after, to be faithful and continually lifting him up, preaching the word, teaching the word, and loving the people, even with the hard work of covenantal church membership and compassionate church discipline. God bless you. Tab Media is more than a newspaper. While we have grown to be a podcast, a radio show, an online news source, and have a social media presence, we are more than those things too. We desire to empower our readers and listeners to live out discipleship in all parts of life. We want to help you always shine bright as a light in the darkness. Tab Media is more than a newspaper. It's a mission.